Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is fiction writer Gish Jen. Her works include four novels, Typical American, Mona in the Promised Land, The Love Wife, and World in Town. She is also the author of Who's Irish, a collection of short fiction. Jen's most recent book, Tiger Writing, Art, Culture, and the Interdependent Self, is a nonfiction work based on the Massey Lecture she gave at Harvard in 2012. Jen gave a reading at the University of Oregon on April 21, 2014, as part of the series Asian American Voices, a Collins Literary Forum, which, prese which was presented by the English Department. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Would you mind reading something from your work? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Okay, so this is a section from Bolden Town, um, and this is a, an ice fisherman, a Vermont ice fisherman talking. In an ideal world, the shack would be out in the ice instead of in the air, a fishing shanty instead of a treehouse. In an ideal world, he'd be pulling up the smelt instead of hanging out with the birds, wishing the wind would not howl so loud, wishing he'd put in a stovepipe that vented right no matter which way the wind was blowing instead of only some ways, and maybe wishing some other things while I was at it. What the heck? That that Cambodian kid get out of the hospital all right, that'd be one. That Ginny turned back into the girl he married, that'd be another. What the heck? Because used to be she was the sweet girl. Used to be she was a gal no one would ever imagine getting mixed up with the Cambodian girl the way she did, pursuing her, and causing his trouble too, he's going to guess, the fire, everything somehow causing it, causing it somehow. What went wrong now? He's talking about what went wrong, how a sweet gal got to be so angry the way she did, what went wrong. When she was born again, Jenny used to draw these pictures showing her life before and after. Two little circles she'd draw with a throne in the middle of each one. The before circle would be her life with an E in the throne, standing for herself, for her ego, she'd say. The part of her that was self-centered, the part was, that was all about me. Christ would be there in the circle too, but he'd be kind of floating around along with the other things she was doing. Cooking, working, driving the kids to baseball. They'd all be these dots floating all over until she took Jesus Christ for her Lord and asked him to rule her life, she'd say. And then there'd be the after circle, see, with Christ on the throne. Her ego would be off to the side and everything she did would be arranged in a circle, like they were minute dots on a clock, organized so you could draw a line from them to Christ in the middle. And that'd be her new life now, organized. That was the story she told. Thank you so much, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Did you um, interview ice fishermen when you were preparing to write that? <laughs> yeah, well, it just so happens I actually my um, I actually do have a, a house in Vermont, and uh. we are on a lake, and um, and so there are ice fishermen right out our door. <laughs> 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 and, you know, and uh, you know, a writer sees those people, and she thinks material. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the most distinctive qualities of your fiction is your ability to create the distinct voices of these different characters. Why is that such an important part of your fiction? Why is giving this very distinctive voice to these very different people, why is that so important for you? Well, you know, it's just who I am, I have to say. You know, I did a lot of research for this book, World in Town. You know, there's a lot of in, in it about ethnicity, but also a lot about religion. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that, you know, I went to many, many churches. And, um, and I had a friend um, who was at the Divinity School at Harvard um, who was showing me around and you know it's interesting because um, she was watching me work you know and you know after we had made I don't know three or four trips she said to me you know I always thought that a writer writes she said but now I see that a writer listens and I mean I don't know that all writers um, work that way but for me it is very much just part and parcel of what I do um, obviously, um, in the end, when people talk about voice, it's, it's all my sensibility. It's certainly, it's what I see, it's what I make of it, right? It's still my vision. Um, but part of my vision is, is to capture, you know, the, the, the many ways in, in which people talk, which is actually, of course, the way that they see things, right? It's, it's, it's what they, they say because it's what they know, and it's what they know because it's what they took in. Hmm. So it's a kind of anthropological approach to, to writing fiction? Well, I guess it is a little bit anthropological. I mean, I think that, um, you know, in the end, um, you know, it is my filter. So I'm not like, a, you know, an anthropologist is just out there to see mm -hmm. what's there. Uh, they're not trying to make a work of art out of it, you know. Um, I am out there looking at things, but finally I want to make something. 
you know, I want to make something. And so um, there's a way in which um, everything um, is itself, but also it's part of maybe a, a larger thematic or metaphorical structure, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, so that, so not, in, in my work, nothing is only itself, right? Mm -hmm. So an anthropologist is happy just to get it straight. Um, I must get it straight and I must, you know, I'm, if, um, if an ice fisherman reads my book, I, I don't want him to say, oh wow, you know, we don't catch smell, right? <laughs> You know, it's important to get those details right, um, but um, but in addition, it, it has to have, I would say, not actually not just one other use, but two or three or four or five other uses, right, huh. before we can call it fiction. So I'm going to ask you some questions that you've been sure. asked before. You're the child of Chinese immigrants. First, say a little bit about what led your parents to come to the United States in the 40s. Ah, yeah, well, you know, uh, my parents um, came for different reasons. My mother came. Um, in truth, she had had an arranged marriage that she did not like, mm. and in sort of in, in the process of kind of disengaging herself from that, um, she uh, was sent for a year abroad. You know, it was called gilding the lily. You know, just the way we might take a, a graduate year in France or something. Um, so she came. Um, she never intended to get caught here. Uh -huh. I mean, she was you know exactly the way we might take a year you know at Oxford or something. Mm -hmm. uh, she was was simply um, she was simply a broad broadening herself when when the revolution happened. Um, my father, um, my father for all that came as part of the war effort. So um, during the Second World War, you know, there's talk of opening a second front against the Japanese in the Shanghai Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, that meant that they needed people to coordinate that effort. And so my father was a hydraulics engineer. Um, so he was sent um, all the way. We couldn't cross the Pacific; too dangerous. Right? So he was sent. Um, all the way across China over the hump, which is in Himalayas. That was a very, very dangerous plane ride, actually. Very dangerous. Um, and across India, across Europe, across the Atlantic, by the time he got here, the war was over. Mm. <laughs> um, but he stayed to do some graduate work. And um, But again, it was never his intention to stay in the United States. And so, um, in the truth, he was part of a cohort um, that was kept here um, against their will. Uh, what happened was that um, you know, once it became clear that the communists, you know, were kind of a, you know, a, a, a real force to contend with, um, the, you know, the government, um, the U.S. government and the nationalist government got together, and they knew that, you know, a lot of the Chinese scientific talent was here, mm -hmm. and um, and they and they agreed that that talent should not be allowed to go back to the mainland. So, you know, my father had colleagues who tried to go back. I mean, their families were in China, right, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, they were taken off the boats in, in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So they were kept here against their will. Um, and this is this is a story which is told in typical American, and it's true. Um, so here are my parents, they were unwilling immigrants. Uh, that meant things like my father refused to become a citizen. He was offered citizenship hmm. under a refugee act, um, but he said, we're not refugees. <laughs> you hmm. know, it's just if you went, you went to China, you know, mm -hmm. you thought you'd work on your Mandarin. You went there and, oh, and they said, oh, you can't go home, but we'll make you a Chinese citizen. You know, your reaction is, forget it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the result, of course, is that we were in quite a difficult situation for, mo for most of my youth because my father was not a legal citizen and, you know. <laughs> so how did, how did you guys wind up in Yonkers? I, I grew up in Irvington, so I know Yonkers well. How'd you, how'd you wind up in Yonkers? Well, you know, my parents, it was, the, I think, kind of kind of a classic immigrant progression out of the city. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, first they were in Queens, uh, I see, I see. you know, and then they moved northward to Yonkers. Eventually they moved to Scarsdale, mm -hmm. which is where, um, my second novel, Mona and the Promised Land, is set, mm -hmm. and from there they went on. Um, today they're in Chappaqua. Well, my mother is in Chappaqua. Oh, <laughs> my best friend grew up in Chappaqua. So they're with the Clintons. Straight, straight north, right, exactly. Now that they're in the same town as the Clintons, <laughs> they've arrived. So what, for you growing up, you, you know, you, you, so you're, you're living in Yonkers until, what, fifth grade, something like that? Yes. And then you moved to, to Scarsdale. Exactly. So Yonkers, working class. Yes. And uh, more white ethnic. Right. You moved to Scarsdale, upper middle class, yes. large Jewish population. What was that shift like for Chinese immigrant family before the era of multiculturalism? What, what was that moving from Yonkers to? Well, you know, of like? course, it, it. I would say both places were very difficult in mm -hmm. their own way. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we were, you know, the only uh, Chinese American family that that you know people had seen in really in either town. <laughs> In Yonkers, New York, you know, people, I mean, really, they had just never, ever seen anyone who looked like us before. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was working class. And, and you know, because it was working class, I have to say, it was rough. Um, I mean, uh, we definitely had rocks thrown on us. And I think to this day, I can never, you know, when I look at my own children and, you know, when, you know, and, you know, when snowballs are, are thrown at them, they never have to worry that there's a rock in the in inside of the snowball. 
you know, when I was growing up, you know, a snowball was thrown at you, there's often a rock in it. And um, there's a lot of trouble. My brother was always in fights, and um, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was, it was difficult. Um, you know, Scarsdale was a very different place. I mean, again, we were the only <laughs> Chinese Americans in town, or the only Chinese Americans with kids in the, in the school, and so we were, you know, we were the object of, of a lot of curiosity. But it was very different in that it was friendly. I mean, so, you know, it was because it was predominantly Jewish, um, you, know, the, you know, the Jews were people who had seen a lot. And um, you know, and they they knew what it was to be an outsider. So you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have a minority, the majority in town, and and um, and so um, while well, I, I can't say that it was you know just you know it was not a bed of roses, um, it was certainly much more welcoming and 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 and, and really qu quite wonderful. And you know, there is a way in which my second novel, A Moment in the Promised Land, is kind of a love letter to Scarsdale mm -hmm. in some ways, and and I I'm I'm very grateful. Um, of course, I'm also grateful because um, one feature of that particular community is that they revered writers, mm -hmm. you know, and so there there is a way in which, um, I, you know, I, I do I do feel that growing up in Scarsdale is a, is a lot of why um, I became a writer. So tell that part of the story. So how did that? How did how did being in Scarsdale? Make well, you for one thing, of course, there's this, this, this tremendous emphasis on voice, mm -hmm. right? I mean, voice storytelling, all those things. Um, I did recently write this book, Tiger Writing, Art, Culture, and the Interdependent Self, in which I talk about the fact that, you know, being from, um, having roots in an Asian culture, um, I had roots in a, in a culture which is fundamentally non-narrative, you know, so, and it's it very, very fundamentally non-autobiographical. So, so it is a culture where, you know, you know, you do not have baby pictures of you, you know, <laughs> when you're six months old, seven months old, eight months old, um, you know, where people are not looking at you to try to understand what's unique and special about you so that they can bring that forward um, in, in the world. Um, um, quite the contrary, you know. You know, it, you, I, w I came from a role where what was important was, you know, what, what role, what your role was, that you understood your role and that you played it well. Um, and then, you know, the, now all of a sudden I'm in, I'm in Scarsdale, New York, which is, you know, quite an independent culture and where, you know, being able to self-narrate is very important. Um, I do think that the, just that starting with the playground, you know, what, what everybody, of course, could tell a story that had beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds like something which is so, um, seems so obvious today, but honestly, for people from an interdependent background, that's not a given. So. Um, the fact that I was steeped in it, you know, I was steeped in this beginning, middle, end, steeped in it, uh, steeped in a kind of narrative that focused on, on, a, on an individual. You know, I understood that, that that was the way that stories were told in the West. Um, I, I think it was treme tremendously helpful. Um, also helpful was the fact that, that, that you know, Scarsdale was a, is a rich town with, with wonderful libraries. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I had come from, um, in Yonkers, I had gone to a Catholic school, and uh, that meant that there was a donation library, <laughs> a lot of books on lawn care, I mean, just, you know, everything. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was a very kind of old, you know, it's an old room with sagging shelves, dark, not very many books, you know. You know, to get to the Scarsdale, you know, I still remember the Green Acres Elementary School Library. I mean, I, I just, I couldn't believe it, and I did, I read, Every book in the library, um, and um, I mean, I was just, you know, I, I, it was, it was a fantastic thing for me, and so I don't know, you know, had I, had I not moved to a town with a library like that, had I not been, you know, just, you know, um, immersed in this, in the storytelling culture, mm -hmm. and a culture, of course, where, if, you know, where literature was so esteemed, and, mm. um, you know, so, so um, I had fantastic, fantastic English teachers. Um, if I had not had those teachers, I don't know. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I interviewed Samantha Chang, yeah. and she's recently um, more sympathetic to the argument that writers are not made, but they are born. It's interesting that you're you're making a somewhat different argument here. Well, I think the truth of the matter, it's you know, it's nature yeah. nurture, right? Mm -hmm. And the, th the, uh, the it is also true that actually, I actually um, on the ch on my mother's side, I actually come from quite a literary background. Mm. Interesting. So um, you know, and my um, so if if you look back, um, uh, my grandfather um, was ki quite a literary guy, and um, he uh, there's a, a writer Maldun is a very famous. Um, Early early twentieth century Chinese writer, and um, you know he was the one who found Mao Dun. Mao Dun, he huh. was a teacher. Mao Dun came to his school, and he was the one who went to Mao Dun's mother, and said, "You must let him write." 
and um, and uh, got him his first job in publishing in Shanghai. So, you know, there's a way in which actually I did I did actually have, you know, literature. Um, my my mother's earliest memories are sitting on my on my grandfather's lap um, reciting poetry. So you know, so so it's it's complicated. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can have that kind of thing in your background, but with but without. You know, without the environmental support, I just don't. It's like anything else. There's seeds. The seeds are mm -hmm. fine. You need the water if you want to see anything grow. Mm -hmm. So you're best known for your works of fiction. You've written four novels and book of short stories. Why is fiction your preferred genre? Why is that? Well, the? I have to say that after tiger writing, I'm not sure that it is ah, my preferred genre. You know, um, um, it's it's hard to say why, but I think that um, you, you know uh, you know in here, I I, I mean I, I I'm. I, I, I really don't know. You know, why do we have the desire to make thing, these things up? You know, but for me, I think that um, if you think about how new the world was to us mm -hmm. as this immigrant family, you know what I mean? Because we have no preconceptions whatsoever. Everything is new, you know? So it's as if, you know, you have just gone to some country that you didn't even know existed. You know, it's fascinating. You know, the desire to write it down, to write down what you see, to think about what it is, to try to line that up with the reality at home. I, I, I think that, you know, um, it's kind of amazing that all immigrants don't become mm -hmm. fiction writers, mm -hmm. in, in, in my view, because um, it's, it, you know, it's, 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 you know, you walk outside and, and, and it, there's so much, and, 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 the, and the voices, right? Because, um, you know, the, the, the voice that I hear at home is, is not, you know, are not these voices. Um, so um, I guess, I don't know if that's an answer for you exactly. That's a fascinating answer. So you've mentioned tiger writing a couple of times. That's a work of nonfiction, the first major work of nonfiction that you've done. It results from an invitation you received to give the Massey lectures at Harvard. Why did you accept that inf invitation? <laughs> what, what was it that made you say yes? Well, first of all, I first said no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, I was, in, I was still working on World in Town. I said, you know, I'll be happy to talk to you when my novel is done. Um, but, um, but it's not something that you can say no to. It's, you know, it's a tremendous honor. I think from the beginning of the Massey Lectures, you know, it is the kind of the big lecture series associated with the American Studies program mm -hmm. at Harvard. And, um, and I think from the beginning of the program till now, I mean, it's just been a handful of writers. Mm -hmm. It was the Adora Welty, E.L. Doctorow, Tony Morrison, Maxine Hunt Kingston, and I, you know, you, I I, yeah, I they all said yes. I why to say no, right? And so of course I said yes. Um, that's a, you know is the most it was the, definitely the scariest thing I've ever done. So t you had something to, to 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 say though. I mean, you you had a story to tell. You had you had a nonfiction narrative to present. Well, I didn't know that at first. Uh -huh. You know, I first just said I would do it, and then I just thought, oh no, you know, and um, and uh, I think the one thing that was clear to me was that, you know, that, you know, given, you know, people said, oh, we can write about anything, you know, but, you know, we could, I mean, man, who's going to write about Emily Dickinson with Helen Van Loo sitting right there, right? <laughs> <Good> <laughs> so, so, but, you know, so it was really, um, I didn't know right away, but it is true that, that, um, that uh, once I thought, well, what is it that I could usefully contribute, you know, this thing popped out and it was rather a big thing. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's very well, I mean, you get the feeling reading it that, it had been percolating for a long time. Well, it had been. You know, it's one of these things where, when I look back, and you know, it, it, part of my master's thesis in, in 1983 um, from the from the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, you know, there was a an, you know a scholarly component, and, and I wrote about individualism. Mm -hmm. So obviously, this has been on my mind for a long time. Um, that's you know that kind of cultural things in general are, are very difficult to write about, and it just so happens that as I was sitting down to these Massey lectures, thinking, remembering this thing that I'd written in 1983, um, it just so happens that some, you know, some very significant um, cultural, psycho psychological um, studies that were coming out, mm -hmm. and, you know, but these studies are brand new, you know, so I was just very, it, just, it was just a very lucky thing mm -hmm. that the studies were coming out uh, just as I was sitting down to look at the subject again. Mm. Um, I have to ask you about the title, mm -hmm. Tiger Riding. Um, explain the title, <laughs> first of all. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure that I can explain it exactly. Uh -huh. um, I will say that you know it is partly um, a reaction to um, to you know, Amy sure. Schwaz. Um, I, there is a way in which I think I wanted to take back Tiger. I mm -hmm. think that you know which is uh, which is a way of taking back 
really China, mm -hmm. what it means to be Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to complicate it, you know, in, in the way that I understand what it means to be Chinese, which is that, you know, it, this is not this is not a single thing. If you think it would know, you know what it means, you do not. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a way in which, uh, you know, I think it was also just a handy way of, 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 of signaling that this was an East-West book. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, over the course of the book, you know, uh, tiger writing, which you think is, means East, but it kind of morphs into something else, right? And so, um, and you tell a and story like though in in there about the tiger. Do you remember the story? Uh, you mean the the story about the, mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 use of, of of writing in order to tame a tiger? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and that's a very that's a very Chinese story where uh -huh. you know it's about somebody who who you know who, who 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 writes something in order to kill this tiger that's that's afflicting this village. And um, you know that's a very that's a very Chinese idea. It's very instrumental, a very mm -hmm. instrumental mm -hmm. use uh, view of writing, um, which of course is very much at odds with 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 the idea of of writing as an end in itself, which is a very Western Western idea, right? Um, and also writing as a means of self discovery, um, but of course writing. Is also a fantastic means of self-discovery, mm -hmm. and you know. So, in my mind, uh, tiger is, the tiger writing is is both this instrumental thing and this very uh, non-instrumental thing. Hmm. Very interesting. So, you begin the book with an essay about your father and the autobiography he wrote at eighty-six. What surprised you about that auto about his autobiography? Well, you know, uh, my father d did write this autobiography, and uh, of course, I was very excited about it. It took the form of a series of emails. Um, and um, but what was so surprising about it was that it didn't look anything like um, the, you know the narrative that I had learned from my <laughs> from my schoolmates <laughs> you know in Scarsdale um, you know it, of course it should have started I am born like David Copperfield and it didn't mm -hmm. start that way at all um, my father no he, um, he did not mention himself until the eighth email you know he finally he finally mentions himself and then and there he is he mentions himself um, in parentheses. And his birth is in parentheses in conjunction with another event, you know. And um, so that when I first looked at this, I just thought, you know, you know, what is this about? You know, what kind of an autobiography is this? Um, since writing this book, uh, you know, many, many, many people mm. have come up to me who are exactly mm. in the same situation where, you know, they're all excited. You know, uh, a parent or a grandparent just sat down to write something. And like my father's, it makes apparently no sense at all, hmm. right? Um, it does not begin with themselves, and moreover, it seems not to be about them at all. You know, it's very much focused, you know, on the, on, you know, in in, in gory detail, on on the context. You know, my, my, my father, his house. You know, ev everything about his house, as if we care about his house. You know, well, well, where are you? But um, that was, I think, it was my first view in. To a different self, where um, to, you know what they narrate, what they see is completely different than what we see in the West. And that's the interdependent self. That, you that is the about. interdependent self. So, um, do you still feel that you're sort of that you have this? You called yourself a changeling in the book. That there's this doubleness to your character. Uh, that you're both. You talk about strategically shifting between an interdependent self and a depend, uh, an independent self. Do you still feel that's the case? Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think that um, yes, I think that I have I have both selves, and I will say that you know in having two selves, you know I'm not unusual <laughs> actually. You know, it's actually um, many people, and I think and a growing number of people mm -hmm. have have both selves. And um, I think that you know when we think about these selves, we I think there's been a tendency to only think about the conflict, mm -hmm. you know, between them. And of course there are times when when the demands of the two selves are in conflict you know for instance becoming a fiction writer you know um, the fact that I'm here giving this interview when really you know the, the interdependent part of me you know I should be home taking care of my mother right um, so obviously you know there are times when these when these um, cells are in conflict um, but it is also true that you know that they they, they are you know a kind of passport right I mean there's the, you know you can enter so many more worlds mm -hmm. Um, and um, so th there's, there's a tremendous agency, I think, in, in having both cells and in, in being able to, to, um, to, to deploy, I guess, um, one or the other, depending on, on what it is, you know, is whatever is most helpful. Hmm. So um, are you working on anything new? I am days? working on something new. Can you tell us anything no. about it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, I have a different question. Um, this one you'll be able to tell me. Um, have you read anything recently that you'd like to tell us about that you'd like to recommend? Well, actually, you know, it just so, it just so happens that on the way here, <laughs> that um, um, uh, you know, is uh, my uh, 
I came in on the flight from San Francisco. I connected in San Francisco to here, and um, and I sat there in the lounge with a with a galley of a new book, and it didn't make me miss my connection. So it really was very good. Um, and this is a book called um, The Liar's Wife by Mary Gordon. It's going to be out in August. It's about four novellas about um, about Europe and America. Um, I liked many many things about it. Um, one of the things I liked about it was the fact that she's so good with cultural detail. Mm -hmm. You know, she never she never stereotypes, but she gets all the details right, and she has a, a wonderful appreciation for cultural difference. Um, but of course, as in my work too, she make every detail is is correct, and it also speaks in a fictive way. Um, moreover, she's she's just wonderful with the big questions, and I and I did find that you know the big questions that she has on the table. I find there are very much questions that you know that I, that I am grappling with, you know, at this stage in life, and um, I, I thought it was fascinating. What are those questions? <laughs> Can you tell me that? Well, you know, what really matters? You uh -huh. know, I mean, this is this is an age where I mean, in the, you know, in the in the title novella, you know, it's really about this woman confronted with this this her ex-husband. It was this incredible liar, mm -hmm. and you know, her whole life has been she has sought clarity, and the truth. But you know, there's a way in which he has lived in this wonderful way, with kind of, kind of <laughs> truth be damned, you know. And you know, so the, so the the very question of whether it was a good thing to have cared about the truth is on the table. I mean, I just you know, I, that's kind of a rather a, a very radical idea. But I think it's something that you know, it's only when you realize that actually. You know, death is no longer something which is only going to happen in someone else's story. Mm -hmm. You know, that you know, that's all of a sudden, everything is on the table. You know, and everything is up for examination. You know, the you know um, the place of beauty in your life, the place of truth in your life. I mean, that's a big one, right? Um, you know, and, and more and more. So you know, so, you know, I just found this to be a, you know a very a very gutsy. And, and, and wonderful book with it, which I will saw also some very wonderful moments in it. Hmm. Well, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us today and to tell us about your writing and your writing life. My pleasure. I've been speaking with the fiction writer Gish Jen. Her most recent book is a nonfiction work titled Tiger Writing, Art, Culture, and the Interdependent Self. Jen gave a reading at the University of Oregon on April 21st, 2014, as part of the series Asian American Voices, a Collins Literary Forum, which was presented by the English Department. I'm Paul Pepys. Thanks so much for watching.